All right, welcome back to the effect. Now we're going to close out our event studies section by looking at a different way of estimating event studies. In fact, possibly one that is more common than the way that I just covered. And in the last video, I talked about estimating an event study by simply fitting a linear regression on one side, the, on the pre-treated period, and comparing that to the linear regression you get from the post-treatment period. That's called the interrupted time series approach. Now we don't actually have to do that. The, the key component of an event study is that you are simply comparing what you observe in the post-treatment period against some predicted counterfactual. You've made a prediction about what you think you would have seen in the absence of the treatment, uh, and you just want to compare to that. That does not require any sort of straight line regression. And in fact, in finance, it's very common not to do that. And since finance is one of the more common places where you see event studies applied, uh, I'm going to talk about in this video some ways that financiers use uh, event study methodology in order to estimate treatment effects. Now, why are event studies so common in finance and why don't they use the regression approach? Uh, well, event studies are common in finance because you see a lot of events in finance. A lot of the time you might be interested in the effect of something happening on a stock return, right? Uh, Google uh, merged it together with something else. What did that do to Google's stock? Uh, Apple unveiled the new iPhone. What did that do to Apple's stock, right? Uh, these are event studies. You have something happen at a particular time and you expect there to be in some sort of effect on some easily observable outcome. Now that of course applies in a lot of different fields, but what is different about finance is something that make, makes event study designs work particularly well. One of those things is that you expect to see an immediate effect. Because finance and, and stock prices and things like that are expected to respond not to like literal actual physical changes, uh, but the expectation of change, you can expect effects to go into play immediately. Like let's say I wanna know the effect of an education program uh, where I want to know, hey, I'm going to, you know, get students better teachers. I'm going to randomly assign them and I'm going to see whether that makes them graduate from college or not. Well, I'm not going to see the effects of that for a long, long time. Uh, even if everyone's pretty confident that my program will work, uh, we will not actually see any changes in the number of college degrees awarded for like 10 years. In finance, on the other hand, uh, prices can change immediately. Apple unveils the new iPhone and 10 seconds later, everyone can do their trading and bid up the price of Apple stock. This means two things. One, uh, it means that we expect to see effects right away, which is really great for event studies. Uh, we have all these methods of making predictions about what's going to happen uh, in the absence of the effect of the event. Those predictions are going to be a lot better if we can make them over a very short time period, right? Forecasting long in the future, making a forecast about how many college degrees there's going to be 10 years from now in the absence of my policy is really hard to do. Making a forecast in the very near term is a lot easier. Forecasting what Apple stock price is going to be one minute from now, knowing what it is right now, is probably pretty easy. So because the effects we expect to be pretty immediate, uh, it make, gives us a lot more strength in using these event study methods uh, because we can be a lot more confident that the prediction that we're making actually does close a time back door because there's not a lot of time for any other effects to sink in. If I'm making a prediction about Apple stock one minute from now, uh, and then I look one minute from now to see what changed, well, I'm pretty sure that it was whatever an announcement they just made about the iPhone and not some other long-term trend that's been going on that I wasn't able to notice. So because we expect immediate effects, uh, it makes the assumptions we need to make for event studies a lot more plausible. Additionally, we might want to use the methods I'm talking about this in this video rather than uh, interrupted time series because we might expect those effects to fade right away. Uh, one corollary of the immediate effects thing is that all the effects are going to happen right away and then they're going to stop. If I look at how much Apple's stock price grew, it's pretty much all going to happen on the first day after they made that event. They announced the new iPhone. Everyone's like, oh, great. That's going to be good for, for Apple. I think that their price is going to go up here. Why would I wait to make the price go up there? I'm going to bid it up there immediately in the course of minutes. And so to, I might see a huge effect today and none tomorrow. And that might be a very common thing to see. Now, when that happens, when you see an effect that is only happening very briefly and then goes away, uh, fitting a whole time series line over here just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because we don't want a straight line. We want an effect that's just there once and then goes away. Uh, and so we need a method that allows for that. So what are the ways in which financiers to make use of this particular setting uh, in order to estimate event studies? So throughout all of this, I'm going to assume that I'm looking at the effect of some event on the price of a stock. This applies more broadly, but just to keep the terms simple. So step number one, I'm going to pick an estimation period and an observation period, roughly the pre-treatment and post-treatment periods. Although that's not necessarily the entire set of the data. I might not use all the data in the pre-treatment. Maybe I give myself a little bit of a lag uh, or maybe I, you know, make it just narrowly right next to the treatment period. I also might not follow it forever in the, in the observation period. Maybe I just look for a couple of days or something like that. 
But the basic idea here is I have some estimation period that I'm using to make some sort of estimate about the general patterns in the data. And then I'm using my observation period to make predictions using those patterns. Uh, and then I'm going to compare to that. So that's step number one, pick the periods, pick the estimation period I'm going to use to estimate my model, pick the observation period that I'm going to use to make predictions in. Step number two, make those predictions, right? Uh, I've got my model that I've estimated from the pre-treatment period in the estimation period. I'm going to make a prediction about what would occur in the post-treatment period, in the observation period. Step number three, compare. I have my prediction for the observation period. I can also see what actually occurred. I predict that maybe Apple's stock price would go up by 3%, and in fact, it went up by 6%. I make that comparison to get something called an abnormal return. Uh, if it actually returned 6%, and I expected it to return 3%, that is three additional percent of return beyond what I could expect based on the prior pattern. That is the abnormal return. It's above and beyond what I would have expected normally. So therefore it is abnormal. Finally, I have my abnormal return. Uh, I might have a different abnormal return in each day of my observation period. If I have multiple different treated groups, I'd have a different abnormal return in each day of my period for each treated group. Uh, and I've, now I can analyze my abnormal returns. I can do things like calculate standard errors for my abnormal returns and see what the effect of treatment actually was. And that is the basic process. And it's not really any different uh, from what I was talking about before. We are still picking a pre-treatment period, an, an estimation period to make our model, making predictions in the post-treatment period, and then making a comparison. The only real difference uh, is that we are not really using a straight line to do it. And in fact, there are three different main ways that we can make those predictions. And here's the real key part of what financiers do. The first approach is the means adjusted returns approach, which is literally just you take the average in the estimation period and you make that average be your prediction in the observation period. This is an assumption, basically, that whatever you saw before would have continued to occur, that there was basically no trend whatsoever, uh, and then you can just use the pre-treatment average to get the post-treatment outcome. Now, this makes a lot more sense than it might seem, because especially if we're talking about stock prices, those tend to be pretty flat over time. Uh, now, stock levels might go up and up and up, but the return on a daily basis might be pretty flat. You might gain about the same percentage each day, give or take. And assuming that that general percentage will continue on in the post-treatment period, not the worst assumption in the world, although of course you would want to think carefully about it. All right, the second approach that we can take is called the market adjusted returns approach. Uh, now the market adjusted returns approach is taking advantage of the fact that, uh, you know, we have a pretty decent comparison that we can make here, which is the actual market as a whole. So let's say we're looking at Apple stock go up and down over time, up and down, up and down, up and down, and we can compare that to the market itself as a whole, right? Now, we might expect the market as a whole and Apple should move in the same direction. Some days are just a good day for the market. Uh, and if we see that Apple goes up by 6% over here in the post-treatment period, we don't want to confuse, uh, you know, Apple going up because Apple did something cool against Apple going up because the entire market went up, right? We don't want to confuse those two. That's sort of a backdoor problem. So the market adjusted returns approach says, hey, you know, I'm not going to use the pre-treatment Apple stock price to make my prediction. I'm going to use the uh, the returns that I see uh, for the market as a whole. So if the market, if Apple went up by 6%, but the market went up by 2%, I'd say, ah, I would have expected Apple to go up by 2% as well. The abnormal return is the additional 4%, and that's the additional return that I'm going to say is my treatment effect. Now, this comparison that I'm making between the 2 and 6% is sort of like using a control group. I'm sort of saying that the market as a whole is my control group. So I would have expected Apple to be just like everybody else in the absence of treatment. And we'll talk a bit more about methods that use control groups uh, in the Difference in Differences chapter, which is coming up very soon. The third and final approach that we can take uh, is the risk-adjusted returns approach. Uh, now, in the market-adjusted returns approach, we said, hey, we think that Apple might stock might track the market in some way, and we're just going to assume that Apple's return would have been whatever the market return was in the post-treatment period, right? Well, now in the risk-adjusted approach, we're going to take that same idea, but we're going to sort of manipulate it a little bit. We're going to say, okay, you know, Apple and the stock market, they sort of go in the same direction, but not to the entire extent, right? Maybe the stock market being 1% higher than normal this day is associated with Apple being 1.5% higher than normal, right? I'm going to estimate a model that says something like, how, what's the correlation between the market as a whole and Apple's stock price? Then I'm going to take that correlation that I get and I'm going to apply it in the post-treatment period. I'm going to say, okay, the stock market went up by 2%. Based on a 2% increase in the stock market, I would expect Apple to go up by 4%, let's say. And so I expect Apple to go up 4% because it tends to go up twice as much as the stock market. And therefore, if it saw, actually saw 6%, then that additional 2% on top is the effect of treatment. 
Uh, this doesn't just have to be as simple as looking at the correlation between the market return and the stock return itself. Uh, there is also like the Fama French factors, which you might have heard of if you've done any finance, uh, which looks at not just the market return as a whole, but also the market return of particular portfolios that do things like buy small stocks and sell big stocks or things like that. Uh, you can take those different portfolios, predict Apple's stock using those portfolios, uh, and then take make that same prediction in the post-treatment period and see how much it deviates from that to get your abnormal returns. Now, those are three main ways that financiers will use without using regression, at least not directly, uh, in order to make the predictions in the post-treatment period that we can then compare our actual observations to. I've used the language of finance throughout all of this, but there's nothing specific to finance about any of this. All these approaches could be used outside of finance. The means adjusted returns approach where you simply use the mean before to predict the mean after, uh, something called statistical process control that you might see in different health fields, uh, where you're simply assuming that there's no trend to worry about whatsoever. The market adjusted returns approach where you are taking the stock price of the individual stock, comparing it to the stock changes in the overall market, uh, that is very similar to just using a control group, which is something we'll talk about much more generally in the difference in differences chapter next time. And then lastly, the risk adjusted returns approach, uh, where you are looking at the relationship between the stock price and different other factors, and then make, assuming that that relationship stays constant in the post-treatment period. Again, you could just predict any sort of outcome using different kinds of factors you expect it to track, and then seeing what you would predict in the post-treatment period and making that comparison to what you do see. Nothing specific, specific to finance about that. You're just saying that some things are correlated and you expect those correlations to stay constant over time. All right, that is it for the event studies chapter. Uh, we will then be moving on very soon into something that sort of combines fixed effects with event studies, which is difference in difference. Hope you'll join me for those videos as well. Thank you. Thank you.